President Obama is traveling to Russia's backyard to assure nervous nations of America's ironclad commitment to their security. Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry is traveling with the president, coming to us tonight from Estonia. Hi, Ed. Good evening, Brett. A quick stop here on the way to a NATO summit where leaders are expected to endorse a rapid response team of 4,000 troops in Eastern Europe that would deal with Russian aggression. Well, Russian officials responded today firing back. They'll adjust their own military strategy amid fears in this region that this war of words could quickly become an actual hot war. NATO has played a leading role and produced ample evidence to indicate uh, that Russia has intervened in ways that grossly violate the territorial integrity of the independent nation of Ukraine. Uh, and that is something that uh, the United States, along with all of our international partners, uh, stands four square against. It's no accident that on his way to a NATO summit later this week, President Obama is first spending the night in Estonia, just over 100 miles from Russia's border. White House officials added this stop to send a message to Russian President Vladimir Putin that the U.S. will stand up for tiny NATO allies like Estonia that could be in Russia's crosshairs next, just days after the president's latest warning to Putin about his repeated moves into nearby Ukraine. Russia is responsible for the violence in eastern Ukraine. The violence is encouraged by Russia. The separatists are trained by Russia. They are armed by Russia. They are funded by Russia. President Putin and Russia have repeatedly passed by potential off-ramps to resolve this diplomatically. Unlike Estonia, however, Ukraine is not a member of NATO that would enjoy the Article 5 protections of military support from the U.S. and other member nations. And thus far, sanctions have done little to stop Putin's aggression. I think Putin thinks he holds the high cards. He doesn't see anything in his way. And uh, I think he's going to continue to press until he meets opposition. That opposition is expected to be hammered out at the NATO summit in Wales later this week. Putin will not be there since Russia is not a member of NATO. There's been little diplomatic progress since his last face-to-face -face meeting in June with Mr. Obama in France on the sidelines of the festivities around the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion. There are now reports that Putin told the president of the European Commission in a phone call, if I want, I could take Kiev in two weeks. Significant that Putin aides are downplaying the remark, but they are not denying it tonight. Brett? Ed Henry live early Wednesday morning in Estonia. Ed, thank you. So what does all this turmoil around the world, and in some cases chaos, mean for President Obama? Senior political analyst Bert Hume is here tonight with some thoughts. Welcome back, Rick. Thanks, Brett. Nice to see you. One way the Obama administration and its defenders have warded off calls for more aggressive action in this increasingly messy and dangerous world is by defining enemies as narrowly as possible. Thus, Al-Qaeda became not a growing extremist movement, but a much smaller entity known as Core Al-Qaeda. Once Osama bin Laden had been killed, Al-Qaeda was considered basically defeated or decimated, as some like to say. Al-Qaeda offshoots and affiliates might be attacked with an occasional drone strike, but were otherwise treated as secondary threats. The president's dismissal of ISIS, formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, as a junior varsity operation is the best example, but you can hear echoes of the same thinking from defenders of the president's hesitancy to act aggressively in other areas. Intervention in Ukraine, even as indirect as sending weapons is resisted on the basis that the bites Vladimir Putin is taking out of Ukraine are no threat to the U.S. homeland. The lack of urgency about a strategy to defeat ISIS in Syria is defended on the same basis. The president evidently is determined not to do anything stupid about these current crises. By stupid, he particularly means waging war. And his backers cite polls showing the public doesn't think much of the idea of war. Which raises this question. With the commander-in-chief downplaying the threats, why would people think anything else?